And all right, so we are live, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome in. Uh, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. All month long, we are highlighting incredible explorers from across the globe. I think our first seven sessions have uh, are coming from five different countries. We've had France, the UK, Gabon, and the rivers of Gabon. So that's really exciting. And today we are joined live in Trinidad by a new speaker coming in for the very first time. So Anthony Ganas, uh, welcome in. Thank you so much for taking part today. We're really excited to dive in with your presentation on coral reefs and uh, highlight all the cool work you get to do. Yeah, thanks, Jesse. Thanks for having me, and I'm I'm pretty excited. You just let me know how it goes. Um, <laughs> if you don't understand my accent, I get really excited and I talk fast sometimes. So if I if you need me to slow down, just let me know. Um, and I guess we'll have all the Q and A's after, right? So, yeah. all right, awesome. All right, cool. so thanks everybody for having me. Um, so I thought, you know, it's amazing that I could join Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, but I think in order to explore the oceans, you need a little bit more. So I decided to sort of edit your thing a little bit and say with a mask and snorkel, because I'll be sort of, I hope to be taking you on a journey uh, to discover some coral reefs around Tobago, as well as in the Caribbean, right? So we can then go. So I'll just tell you a little bit of who I am. So I am a marine biologist, so I love exploring and diving um, in the oceans around the world. So most of the time, you would actually see me with a mask on. So I'll just point myself out to you there. And, you know, these masks are very important for different reason than we use today, but it's to allow access to that underwater world, to allow me to see and to sort of observe how fish move, how corals grow, and all this amazing things underwater. Um, also strapped to my back is a tank, which allows me to breathe underwater. So when I go exploring on coral reefs in particular, I'd like to stay under there for at least an hour so I can see what the marine life is doing. And it allows me to take notes and actually, you know, be immersed in the environment. So we have all this special gear that sort of hides my face and, and protects my body and whatnot, but um, I still thoroughly enjoy it. And I, I try to do it as much as possible um, uh, when I'm doing it for work and whatnot. So just a little bit from where I am. So I'll just zoom in. I'm actually from a country which is in the southern part of the Caribbean called Trinidad and Tobago. Um, so the bigger island is actually Trinidad and that's where I live. And so that blue dot is actually where I'm talking to you from now. But a lot of the coral reefs that I work on and I dive on are actually in Tobago, which is that smaller island um, to the northeast of where I am. And actually Tobago has a lot of coral reefs wrapped right around the island. So any kind of beach you go to, if you ever come to Tobago, it's really nice. If you go to a beach, chances are there's a coral reef that is just under the water there for you to explore. So Tobago is more of the paradise postcard island. Trinidad is more city life. And so I enjoy coming to Tobago. Um, and because we live in the tropics, a lot of our waters are clear and we get to go diving quite easily just off the beaches, you can sort of immerse yourself. So this is an example of a coral reef in Tobago. You've got these gnarly looking structures and they're actually corals. And you find a lot of fish that would swim among these corals and that, that um, marine life that you get uh, forms the coral reef ecosystem. So that's just sort of an animation of me sort of pretending to be a fish underwater there. So I'll just explain briefly what a coral reef is, because I'm sure a lot of you have heard um, multiple explanations, but I'll just give you a simple one. So if you imagine our cities like New York City, London, uh, the capital of Trinidad is Port of Spain, the cities are very are bustling with life, it's mostly human life. So you can imagine a coral reef being an underwater city bustling with marine life. You would find at least hundreds of species of fish living on a reef. And they're all there because the corals that actually grow there. So this is an example of a coral reef that I'm showing you. Uh, the corals, which are pointed out there, they actually form sort of the buildings of that city. So corals are a, an animal and they are re relative, related to jellyfish. 
Uh, but they don't drift around in the ocean like jellyfish do. They actually settle in one spot and they grow with a rocky skeleton. And that skeleton is so important for providing houses for fish, lobsters and crabs to live in and among. Uh, you don't find coral reefs everywhere in the world. They actually grow specifically in warm tropical places. And that's because they need the sunlight to grow. And that's because corals actually host little tiny plants in their tissues, which use the sunlight to grow and photosynthesize. And that's how they're able to grow to these enormous structures that you can actually see from space. So like I said, corals need clear water so the light can trans to can um, sort of come through the clear waters and, and the corals can actually receive that light to grow. And they also need a lot of fish to help them grow. So because corals live in one spot, they kind of need the area around them to sort of grow. So what the, cor the fish do, they sort of clear the areas around the corals and they feed on them, on the algae and sponges, so the corals can grow bigger and bigger, which means that there are more homes for fish and lobsters and whatnot to grow, uh, to live in and, and utilize, right? So they're very important ecosystems, um, especially for island nations like Trinidad and Tobago, where I live. So what do you find when you imagine that you're gonna dive in a coral reef in Tobago? You're gonna find a lot of different corals that look very odd and have different shapes and sizes. So whereas in the Caribbean, where where I am, you get about a hundred or just over a hundred species of corals. In the Pacific, you get thousands of species. So while we only have a few, they still serve the same amount of functions as the number of corals in the Pacific. So they're very, very important for providing those homes for uh, marine life. So we get these two types of branching corals, which are quite rare in the Caribbean because they're very sensitive to pollution and disease. But we have quite a few uh, growing around Tobago. They're called the Acropora corals and um, their branches actually uh, create sort of refuge or homes for tiny little fish that can live in between these branches and it protects them from larger predators since the larger fish can't get in between those branches to, to, to eat them. So they're very important for um, protecting these little tiny fish. We also get these kind of corals that look like large boulders or rocks, but they're actually growing and living and expanding. And you do find a lot of lobsters and crabs living underneath them because they form this sort of mushroom kind of shape and you get a lot of fish growing underneath it and seeking a lot of shelter there. The other thing I want to point out about the corals you find in the Caribbean and in Tobago are the beautiful patterns that you get on them. So this is an example of a maze or brain coral by the grooves that you see. So you can actually try and trace one of the grooves and you'll find that it just gets all sort of entangled and you, you pretty much get lost in that pattern. And then the other pretty common coral that you find are not ac actually a soft coral that looks kind of like a tree underwater. And uh, it's a soft coral because it doesn't have a rocky skeleton. It's a softer skeleton, which kind of allows them to sort of sway and bend in the currents. And you do find a lot of fish can actually camouflage in these soft corals and disguise themselves to protect themselves from, from larger fish and predators. So what lives on these reefs, um, particularly in Tobago? So obviously you get hundreds of species of fish living on our reefs. If there is a shape, a uh, fish of a gnarly shape or size or color, chances are you can find one on a coral reef. They vary in so many different ways. You can have a, a long tubular fish, you can have a flat fish, you can have a fish that looks like a diamond. They all come in many different shapes and sizes. And that's because of the, the diversity of the types of habitats that they live in, right? So um, you get a lot of these bluefish. They're called Creole wrasse. And they kind of form these large schools and they sort of swim um, in a flurry over the coral reefs in Tobago. And then you get these fish that are orange and like diamond shape called filefish. 
and they're very awkward swimmers. They kind of come up to you and they just drift to the side. They're very entertaining to look at. Um, other marine animals that we find on our reefs are the sharks. So this shark here is actually a nurse shark um, and they're very lazy. So this one during the day, they like to sleep under at the base of the reef in these shallow sandy patches. And new sharks actually feed on crustaceans. So things like crabs and lobsters, anything with a hard shell. And new sharks actually don't have teeth. They have these fused plates that allow them to crunch on these very hard shells. So they're quite common on reefs in Tobago and um, they're very docile and, and, and lazy. <laughs> um, Another marine creature that comes and visits our reefs in Tobago uh, is the hawksbill turtle. This turtle actually specializes in eating marine sponges. And we have a lot of sponges that are growing in Tobago's coral reefs. And they're a hawksbill because their beak actually looks like the beak of a hawk. So they have that sort of uh, similar sort of look. Um, they're popular on our dive sites. A lot of people love seeing the hawksbill turtles. They just chill out on the reef. They might scratch their shell on a soft coral every once in a while, but they're very, um, they're very common and a, a nice sight to see on our reefs. And of course, you get things like lobsters and crabs that live um, underneath the sponges, and you get them sort of clustering together like this, um, like a little army of lobsters. And then when you look into the sand, you might see, if you look carefully, you might see things camouflaging in the sand. So um, highlighted in purple, you have an electric ray and they tend to like very, very shallow waters and they sort of bury themselves in the sand and they can produce these tiny little shocks to sort of shock their tiny prey like shrimp or crabs before they, they eat it. And they're, they're very small. This guy is not much bigger than my hand. Um, but you do get other, other types of rays that come and visit our reefs, like manta rays that live out in the ocean and the southern stingray, which is also common our, on our reefs. And you find them sort of uh, swimming through our reefs very often. Right. So those are the nice things that we find on our reefs. Um, so because I live on an island, a lot of us uh, in Trinidad and Tobago rely on our reefs for many different reasons. Right. Uh, firstly, uh, we have very popular coral reefs. So people come from around the world to come diving, go diving in Tobago. And so a lot of people here, their job is to take them on these dives, to provide tours and whatnot. So uh, coral reefs actually give jobs to people who, who know how to dive and who know how to drive boats and take people out on the reefs to see the coral reefs. Uh, they also serve an important function in protecting our coastline, right? So they act like a seawall or like a, yeah, like a seawall where they sort of break the waves that come towards the coast. And you'd find that the beaches in Tobago are very calm. And that's because they have a reef offshore that sort of dampens the waves and makes the waves a lot more calm before they reach the uh be before they reach the shore. And that's very important to protect our homes, any houses that live along the coast, they rely on these reefs for that protection. Um, and I rely on the reefs because it's part of my job as a scientist. I'm always looking and exploring the coral reefs around Tobago to see, um, to see the sort of uniqueness. So we have a lot of of sponges, for example, on Tobago's reefs. And sponges are very important for medicines. A lot of our uh, medicines for viruses come from marine sponges. So you can actually um, investigate uh, and look at marine sponges all over the Caribbean to see how they can help further science in terms of, of medicine. I'm also interested in how the reefs vary from place to place naturally. So how the shape of one coral might look completely different in a different environment and what that would mean for the fish that, that live there. And if it's a fish that we're interested in, you know, how that would help or hurt our fisheries, right? And speaking of fisheries, um, that is a major source of income for a lot of people in Trinidad and Tobago. We have a lot of fishermen um, or fisher folk rather that, that 
actually um, catch fish to eat and to sell. And so the coral reefs provide that habitat in which the fish live and grow and reproduce in. And last but not least, coral reefs are very important to us for our enjoyment and life and lifestyle, you know, because we are fortunate enough to be living on an, a tiny island, we often try to get out on the water to see what the reefs look like. So we have these like glass bottom boats where we can go on. And even if you don't know how to dive, you can actually see the reefs through these glass bottom boats. And it's really nice for kids to sort of go and, and um, go in, on these trips on the glass bottom boats. <laughs> um, so even though you know we we benefit so much from these reefs and and they provide us with a lot of food and and enjoyment we don't necessarily treat the reefs the best that we could and we could always improve uh to do better because the healthier we keep our reefs the the healthier our future is in terms of our jobs in terms of our food uh the food we eat and whatnot so um we do have problems with pollution so um, living on an island, a lot of what we put down our drains often ends up along our coast and into the ocean. So things like if you imagine the oil that runs off the roads that get into our storm drains, that would get flushed into the rivers and then it gets out into the coral reefs. Uh, things like household detergents and chemicals, they also would find their way to the reefs. And often that causes the corals to become sick. So if you imagine when I told you that coral reefs like clean, clear water, if the water becomes murky, they can no longer access light to grow and they often get sick. Uh, they often allows bacteria to bloom and causes diseases and corals. So that's not very good for us and it's not very good for the animals that rely on the coral reefs. Another thing that's a problem, not just in Trinidad and Tobago, but throughout the Caribbean and a lot of places in the world is garbage. A lot of uh, old tires, so like industrial garbage, like large structures that people think people tend to dump into our coastline and they think it's out of sight, out of mind, when in fact they're, it's actually hurting us because it's affecting the habitats that we rely on. Um, another type of garbage that is hard to get rid of is plastic pollution. And I know you'll be um, discussing that later on in the months, but plastic pollution uh, smother, plastics tend to smother marine life. You know, you find um, a candy wrapper that would be blocking, you know, the whole of a crab that lives on a coral reef. So um, a lot of our plastic pollution also ends up in the oceans and on our coral reefs. So we definitely need to do better with disposing our plastics or even using our, reducing the amount of plastics that we use. The other thing that, um, that affects our reefs is how we fish. So in the Caribbean, there's a lot of, uh, the type of fishing that we do can do more harm than good. So for example, we use a lot of net fishing, which is really good because it can collect a large volume of fish. So if it's a fish that we eat, it's really nice because we can collect a large volume of it, but also the net can collect other things that we don't want. And we find that with net fishing, you get marine turtles, you get dolphins, you even get pieces of coral that get hooked up in the net. And so it gets quite destructive. And when we actually hurt marine life like marine turtles, you know, they serve very important roles in eating algae and sponges on the reef. We actually hurt the reefs as well. And so we need to do better in sort of selecting the type of fishing that doesn't hurt the habitat itself, the coral reef itself, right? Um, and then finally, um, the last thing is climate change and global warming. So while coral reefs like tropical warm waters, they don't like it too hot. It's like a bath that's just right, you know, like not too cold, not too hot. It's just right. But unfortunately, uh, with global warming, our oceans are getting warmer. And so particularly in the summer part, the waters just get a little too hot. And that's when you get things like coral bleaching and um, you get spikes in coral diseases, right? So there are a lot of diseases that are unfortunately impacting a lot of the reefs around the Caribbean. And I think this is a global issue, but 
it is definitely something that we can all do a bit of to help, right? So this is where I come in and this is the job that I do at home is basically, you know, I do, I, I go out and I assess the health of the reefs. I take photographs and I log, I do surveys of the reefs to see how they change over time, whether they're getting better or whether they get worse. And depending on what I find, you know, I would help, I'll go advise people on how we should be reducing our plastic and how we should improve our fishing methods. Uh, we also look at how the water quality is improving or declining in different places. So we can basically advise people on how to dispose of their chemicals or their oils in a better way. Um, and as well, you know, choose a different fishing method that is more sustainable. So catches exactly what you need and not everything else or not destroying everything else at the same time. And some of the more fun part of, of, because I don't like telling people what to do all the time, but I like to educate a lot of kids in Trinidad Tobago. Um, so I, I often go to schools and classrooms here, uh, schools where I grew up in and I learned in. Um, we developed a collection of 360 degree images of all the coral reefs around Tobago. So when children are too young to go diving for themselves, we can actually show them using virtual reality what our reefs look like and how a health, what a healthy reef should look like. And so I think when people actually start seeing what the reefs are, are like in their own backyards, they would actually do a bit more to help. So um, basically I'm gonna end it by um, sort of discussing how you can help, even though you know a lot of people may live thousands of miles from a coral reef. I think there are certain actions that do help globally, right? The first thing that I would love you all to be able to do is explore a coral reef sometime in your life. Hopefully in the future you could get to a tropical island or coastline. So I know there's a lot of coral reefs in Florida, off of Mexico and a lot of places in the Caribbean. I encourage you all to, to explore coral reefs sometime in your life. In your life. And for now, it, because a lot of things are virtual, you can actually go explore Tobago's reefs online. It's called the um, maritimeoceancollection.com. But you can actually just use Google Maps to go exploring coral reefs all around the world. Um, and I think that's the first step to understanding uh, when you actually see and, and explore coral reefs, it's the first time understanding what they're about, and then you learn to appreciate them uh, a lot more. I've I've sh I've certainly uh, put my whole career into coral reefs because I really love their their presence and their beauty. They're they're really spectacular places to visit. Um, apart from that, you know, reducing your energy consumption will do uh, it would help a lot if everybody does a little bit. It will go a long way. So try to get outdoors as uh, a bit more into natural spaces so you don't use too much electricity in your air conditioning, on your computer, and your tablet. Um, you know, reduce the amount of plastic waste. Um, imagine that all the plastic that's ever been created since the 1950s is still around today some in some environment. And so we don't want to continue to add to that pile. We want to reduce the amount of plastic that we're using. So think about your utensils when you're going out, you know, pack some in your, in your backpack, uh, take a little cup with you. And when you can recycle any plastic that you do use. Um, and so that's basically the end of my talk. And I really hope uh, you'll have some questions for me. Fantastic. Well, thank you so, so much. What a cool presentation. We, we covered all of it, basically, that we ever like to cover in Coral Presentations, so I'm excited for questions. And by the way, may I say you have the best office in the entire world. Like, if kids are looking for a cool career to do, uh, the stuff that you shared is, is fantastic. So thank you so much for that. Uh, so yeah, let's dive in with questions, guys. We had a bunch more uh, classes join us after we got underway, which is fantastic. So I'm going to check in with them in a second. Uh, if you're joining us on YouTube or Facebook, let us know where you're joining from around the world. We look forward to sharing some questions there as well. But let's start with Miss Neely's class in King Card in Ontario. Welcome in, guys, to the stream. And if you have a question, just demute your mic. Come on up and uh, ask away. Yep. We need teacher to <laughs> take your time, guys. Yeah, demute the microphone. 
It won't let me do it because you guys muted it on your. End. Oh, there we go. There you go. Perfect. Discovered in other places. Have I just? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, have you ever discovered coral reefs in other places? Yeah, um, there are coral reefs all around the world. So when I was studying, I I actually uh, studied coral reefs throughout the Caribbean. So other islands, in, including Curacao, which is my neighbor, like uh, to the west of us in, um, from Trinidad and Tobago. The second largest barrier reef in the world is off the coast of Central America, which is the Mesoamerican barrier reef. And it's a huge reef system. And it's actually, it's one of my favorite dive sites in the world. Of course, I did my first set of studies for my PhD at the Great, on the Great Barrier Reef, which is over, over 2000 kilometers long. And I was fortunate enough to sort of explore the different places. So I would be on a boat almost 300 kilometers in the middle of the, of the ocean. And then you will have these amazing coral reefs and they were also full of sharks. And I think these are one of the healthiest reefs that I've ever seen in my life. There was, there were no plastics. There were so many fish, um, so much colors. You could lose your dive buddy by the amount of fish that, that were swimming around you. So I was fortunate enough to be able to visit a lot of uh, reefs around the world and, ex and, and sort of explore them. How cool is that? Great question to kick us off, guys. Uh, so let's head to Ms. Nilvo's class in Las Lunas, New Mexico. If you have a question for us, come on in and uh, get away. Hello. Um, even though we're in New Mexico in the desert, our kids have a lot of questions. Um, one of them is, have you found a marine species or maybe even a new species that you didn't expect to be in a coral reef or even in your coral reefs? Oh, that is a good question. Um, I've personally not ex um, found a new species on the coral reefs that I've I've worked on, but I've I know um, there are a lot of species that are being discovered almost every year because you are at, when they look at the genetics, they find that this coral or this pygmy seahorse, for example, which is discovered. Um, on the Great Barrier Reef, it was actually, you know, it may look exactly like a seahorse found in the Indian Ocean, for example, or in the Indonesia, but in fact, it's actually a new species. So there have been a lot of, of discoveries where even though the fish or the seahorse or the coral may look exactly like a species on another side of the world, it's actually a completely different species. And so you do find a lot of these discoveries, especially in the Pacific region. Yeah, fantastic. Um, great question to kick us off, guys. This is awesome. I'm gonna go to Miss Place's glass. Uh, she joined us in the middle of the broadcast, joining in from Miami, Florida. So Miss Place, welcome back in and uh, share away. Hi. <laughs> Hi, sorry we were late. We were getting our, our swimsuits on. Um, oh. So my students um, are joining from Kendale Lakes Elementary School in Kendale, Miami, Florida. And we are, are on multiple screens, so I'm going to field their question. They, um, and we apologize if you answered this at the beginning. My students were from Miami, so we love coral reefs. And they were wondering, is there such a thing as a cold water coral reef? Yeah. And then uh, we grow a lot of, of reef products here in, in labs in Florida, they were wondering, are the lab-grown um, corals exactly the same as the reef that you find in nature? Those are really good questions. Um, so yes, first of all, there are cold water reef systems. Um, these are corals that are specially adapted to uh, the colder temperatures. So I've dived in Bermuda, which is actually gets quite cold. Uh, what you do find there is you get the same species, some of the same species in the Caribbean where it's warmer, but they're especially adapted to the cold temperatures. Um, so you do, you do get cold water ecosystems, but they may not have as many species as you'd find in the tropics. They're, they're basically consisted of the really tough kind of corals or corals that are purely found in those colder environments. Um, the other question about whether the corals that are grown in labs are the same species are as in the wild, I would expect so. I think 
only because that we've only been growing corals for a very short period of time. So maybe in the next 10 years, if we keep the stock separate from the, the wild, they might adapt differently and produce a different type of genetics, right? And so eventually they might uh, be different species. But I think for now, a lot of the stock that we grow in the labs do come from the wild. Yeah. Great question. Thanks, Miss Place. Uh, I love this question from Mr. Kim. He's joining us uh, with his class in Owen Sound, Ontario on YouTube right now. So he wanted to know, he, he went diving in the Philippines and the tour guide was putting his hands sort of going over the coral reefs. But he wants to know, is that something that people should be doing or does touching coral reefs harm them? I'm really glad we got this question. <laughs> touching coral reefs is bad. Um, even though they're made of, of rocks and they appear to be really strong, uh, they're, they're actually, the living part of the coral is that very thin tissue. It's, it's only a couple of millimeters or centimeters thick. And that tissue is actually where the living coral grows. So the whole skeleton is there. It may be uh, meters in size, but that thin layer is actually the living part of the coral, and that is extremely delicate. And so once you scrape that layer off, you are actually killing part of the coral. And in different environments, you know, there's certain environments where they can recover quickly if it's healthy, if the water is clear, uh, it can recover. But in other environments, for example, where it's murky and there's a lot of pollution, once you kill that coral, you might encourage other things to grow there, and you might encourage the coral to get a disease so you're sort of like you know hurting the coral and you might hurt it even more down the line so you look you don't touch you sort of just hover like hover over the reef and you try not to touch it as much as possible yeah, that's fantastic. We had a, a couple dive operators on uh, with a program with NOAA a few weeks ago, and they highlighted the fact that a lot of places, there's certification. So you can look for dive operators or snorkel operators where they go in and they say, look, we're at this high standard where we don't go and touch the coral. We don't go and do things. We're really aware of our impact in the environment. So look for those sort of things. Wherever you're going in the world, you can look for places like that. And uh, that'll hopefully help ensure that they're they're doing really good sustainable tourism. So great question. Thanks, Mr. Kim. Uh, let's bring back Ms. Neely's class. If you guys have another question, come on back in and uh, you'll just need to demute your mic and we'll be good to go. I like the hand out of the... <laughs> Take your time. No hurry. All good. Okay. There you go. Perfect. Go ahead, Matt. Have you ever got stuck in a core reef before? <laughs> Have I got stuck in a coral reef? Yeah, before. Like, have you ever gotten your arm stuck or body stuck or anything? <laughs> no, because I try not to touch the reef. Um, so I think the things about in terms of safety on a coral reef, so again, we don't look or touch because you, when you do get, when you touch a coral reef, remember they're related to jellyfish. And sometimes if you're really sensitive, they can sting you. Um, and there are a lot of, there are a lot of other creatures that are quite stingy on a reef. And so we try to cover ourselves up. We try to sort of stay off a reef. I've heard stories about people sticking their fingers in a clam and getting stuck. So we, we definitely want to avoid that. And we try to minimize that uh, a, a lot of the time. So no, I, I've not gotten stuck on a reef or stuck by anything on a reef. <laughs> I want to highlight too, and this is something we highlight every time we've got amazing, you know, coral reef ecologists, divers, what have you, that all of you can start learning to dive at 10 years old. And I know our grade seven classes, I think, fit that bill. So just check out dive centers near you. They're actually all across Ontario, certainly Florida, New Mexico would probably have them as well. Like you can find dive centers that go to pools, quarries, lakes, what have you. And as and Johnny will, will highlight, it's one of the most amazing experiences you can have in your entire life to get underwater. So. Future. Yeah, you never look back. You'd always want to keep diving some more. Fantastic. Let's go to Ms. Noble's class again. If you guys have a second question for us, come on up. We do. So we heard you speak about the things that you are doing specifically um, to look at the coral reefs, how to take care of them, and you know, going into the schools like that. But we were wondering, what is your country's doing to protect the coral reefs? Um, you hear a lot about different countries in the world putting money out to protect those reefs, but what is your country doing specifically? Yes, that's a question I ask a lot too. Um, no, so we are, our first step is, so the, the field of coral reef science is still fairly young in Tobago. And so what we're doing is we're, the first step is we're looking at places to protect. 
So we have one marine park called Buco Reef, and it's a very popular site. And so now the government's actually starting to manage the reef, so regulate the amount of fishing that happens. In fact, there should be no fishing in this marine park. Um, and we're sort of charging people who want to use the park so that money can go back into making sure the park is doing well. So you can put the money back into projects to help in sort of managing, for example, pollution or making sure that there are places to put your litter if you do go to the parks. We're also trying to um, develop a really large protected area for the top half of Tobago. So imagine Tobago is that sort of oval shape. We want to protect the sort of the northeastern part of Tobago, which is a couple. Yeah, it's a good, it's a, it's a sizable area. And we want to make sure that the fishermen can use certain areas. And so we can regulate different areas of use and protect certain areas that would be completely for conservation and so that fish have a, a safe place to go uh, when they want to. Fantastic. I love, you know, when we get to highlight conservation and action and how some of these like really simple ideas, you know, having a patrol to make sure that people aren't overfishing or charging so that people you know, recognize the value of a place. These things can have huge impacts in protecting ecosystems. I also wanted to bring up a banner for a second to highlight one of the organizations that you're involved with. Uh, and Denise, so species.org, it's something that uh, Diva Amon has, has mentioned in many of her broadcasts. You can check that out as well. See some of the amazing conservation work being done by people in Trinidad and Tobago to protect, uh, you know, the incredible ecosystem that we got a chance to see today. Uh, before I go back to Miss Places class, I want to take one question from Akash, joining us all the way in Vishakhapatnam in India. Uh, so, Anjani, are there any coral reefs that produce electricity? So, we, you know, we talked about maybe electric eels in the past. Any electric corals? I don't know that the answer to that question, to be honest. Um, I know that they use, there is one method that they actually use electricity to help stimulate corals to grow because the, you know, because there's salt water and you have little shock, a uh, little electrical currents that causes sort of the rock to mineralize and that encourages corals to grow. But I don't know about um, corals actually producing electricity. I'm sorry if I don't know the answer. No, that's perfect. perfect. <laughs> we love jumping questions. Uh, one thing I will share in the chat bar in a minute uh, on YouTube, Facebook, and what have you, uh, we didn't get a chance to bring it up, but coral reefs laying eggs, which sounds crazy if you've never seen it or heard of it before, is one of the most beautiful things in all of nature, and I always like to highlight it in reef presentations, so I'll send that as a link you guys can check out after the broadcast. Um, let's head back to Miss Places class uh, in Miami. If you guys have one more question to wrap us up, come on in. Hi, we encourage you to come to Miami. The coral reefs here are absolutely beautiful. And um, our students went to snorkel um, at John Pennycamp Park, which they say they, that they would encourage you to come to on Johnny. But their question is about um, something that is really important right now. We've had a lot of hurricanes in the um, Miami area and also along the um, Gulf. And we know that the mangroves in Miami sort of collect the sediment from the land and keep it off of the reef. And the students want to know, uh, is there something similar to that in Trinidad and Tobago that sort of helps that um, sedimentation process from coming in and, and destroying the reef, especially during this active hurricane season? Yeah, that is a very, very important question. And we we have the similar problems because it is hurricane season here as well. Um, the marine park that is protected, it is surrounded by a mangrove ecosystem and it is a protected mangrove ecosystem as well because it doesn't make sense to protect the coral reef when, you, when it relies on such an important mangrove forest to protect it. So we've, we've protected that area as well. There are unfortunately other places around Tobago that don't have that buffer. So we really need to be especially careful about how we sort of develop our buildings and roads in these bay areas because we've got really steep mountains. And so you can imagine the force in which a lot of the water runs off of our rainforests uh, into these coastal areas. So for those 
places we would have to sort of do a lot of planning in terms of how we, where we put our buildings or where we keep our forest uh, to reduce so that there is a natural filtration system from the actual rainforest themselves before the water uh, gets to the coral reefs. Um, so that is a really important question. I actually studied in Florida, so I did my undergraduate degree at Florida Institute of Technology in marine biology. And I, did, I didn't dive in Miami, but I dived off of Jupiter. And I really do need to go back to Florida to, to see uh, what the coral reefs look like, because I have heard amazing things. So yeah, definitely need to come visit Florida. <laughs> Fantastic. We've inspired some visits when the world is safe to do so. Um, we're almost at the end of the broadcast, and I wanted to I, I want to wrap up by seeing if there's anything one last message you'd like to share. But first, we got a great question written in about any citizen science projects that you might be working on or that you know of where kids can contribute and actually either map coral reefs or highlight coral reefs. Is there anything? Let's see if I can. Oh, I can't quite bring that into the broadcast. But um, Janina, any thoughts on citizen science projects with coral that you know of? Um, so there are, so it depends on the level. So there are some projects in Australia and there are projects that I want to do in Tobago. So for, for children to actually, or citizens to actually use the virtual reality headsets and sort of describe to me what they think about coral reefs or, you know, help me identify what are in these images. Cause they, we've got a lot of images to work through. And so you, we're actually allowing citizens to help me map the reefs, right, using sort of virtual t technology as well as online tools. And there are a lot of similar projects around the Caribbean. Um, in terms of citizen science projects, when you learn to dive as well, um, there is, um, oh, I can't remember, there's Reef Check, which is a very popular, so if you go, if you wanted to visit a, uh, a reef in Florida, for example, or Mexico, and you didn't want to just dive the reef, you can actually go with a reef check dive shop and survey the reef with them. And that way you sort of learn what is there and also see how healthy the reef is. And you can sort of build your own portfolio that way. So there are a number of, of citizen science projects that you can help out either online or, or in real life. Fantastic. Um, before we wrap up, Anthony, is there any last message you'd like to share about your own experiences? Let's encourage kids to get it into, you know, coral reefs of their own when they can safely or, or anything we want to wrap up with. No, I, I think, you know, take the opportunity to explore as much as you can. And I really, really encourage you to, yeah, eventually when you get older, to learn to dive and explore for yourself. In the meantime, explore online. There's so much information and there's so much yet to discover. So you, when you get older, you can actually be discuss, still discovering new organisms. And um, we really need more people out there on, on our reefs and exploring the oceans in general. So. Outstanding. Well, to wrap up, what we always do is I'm going to bring in everyone into the broadcast. And Ms. Nilvo Ms. Place, Ms. Neely's class, if you guys want to join me in saying a huge thank you, Vandy, for joining us today. You're all in. You can all wave. You can all say hi. And uh, thank you so, so much, everyone. We really appreciate the chance to talk with you and, and what a great presentation.